and unpause myself, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Toronto Marlies and also the Toronto FC. She is the nutritionist for the Athletic Canada Eastern Hub Training Group in Toronto. And she's also a member of the Integrated Support Team for Swimming Canada. Ooh, look at all these people coming in. This is great. Um, Jennifer also serves as a lead dietitian for Gymnastics Canada as well. Um, she works with athletes and active individuals of all levels, which are probably all the people that are on this call this evening, um, ranging from weekend warriors and athletes, and also national Olympic and Paralympic level, level athletes. Jennifer's clients range from people you might see in the NHL, the CFL, the MLB, a lot of initials here, the MLS, Ironman, Triathlon Canada, the list goes on. So um, she's a very renowned, world-renowned speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Miss Jennifer Seigo. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate that so much. Um, that's a very kind introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for coming in. I appreciate it. I know I, I gather the weather's been great uh, in Toronto the last few days. I've been getting lots of uh, nice comments from people up north. So just as a way of, of, of honest introduction here, so um, when we booked this presentation, I told uh, Jen that I would be in um, quarantine because my uh, job had taken me down or was scheduled to take me down to Florida uh, to work with uh, the rap. Uh, you have to love technology, don't you? little freeze that's for dramatic effect to work with and uh, after two weeks here oh no you're okay you're back oh no you're back. okay good back. it just said my internet connection's unstable and you all had that beautiful frozen face thing going on for a second I'm like, no, no. okay uh so anyway i was saying that my uh the offer was extended for me to stay for another week and uh, so I was, uh, I'm now here basically to the very nitty gritty dark ending, <laughs> which I was just saying to those who are on the call, uh, involved basically being able to pack up all of the uh, shrapnel from a pretty challenging year for the team. And then tomorrow we fly home. So I am actually speaking to you from my hotel room right now. And um, so, yeah, so I am in Florida with the Toronto Raptors, uh, as Jen was saying. So uh, anyway, so that's what we're doing right now. And then as soon as I'm done with this, I was saying I'm going to be packing up. Uh, now, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. So uh, this presentation is being recorded, so I can see people have their cameras on, which is terrific, but maybe just be aware that you are being recorded. So if you're, uh, for whatever reason, not comfortable with that, or, or you want to not be recorded, then you can just um, turn your camera off. You are all muted right now. Um, there is a chat function. If you're familiar with Zoom, it should be in the bottom of your screen for most people. Um, feel free to ask questions through the chat function. Um, or if I ask you guys questions, you can certainly, um, you can, oh, okay, just pinned so that only I will be recorded. Okay, that's great. But feel free to ask questions in chat and I'll be able to see them as we go along. And then Jen can kind of moderate for questions as well that we can um, ask at the end. So why don't we start by getting a little bit of uh, that chat function going. So if we could, could people just maybe type into the chat box, which sports are of interest to them so that I can make sure that as I'm talking, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the, with the audience here. So maybe just click on chat. And if you're a tennis player, let me know. If you're a triathlete, okay, we see some good tennis coming up already. I know there's some runners in the group. Yeah, and it, and it could be fitness. It doesn't have to be a particular competitive sport. Cycling, hiking, cycling and hiking, lots of tennis, running, triathlon, that's great. I'm an entirely mediocre tennis player. so. One day I'll make it over to you guys and you guys can beat up on me and, and that'll be fine. I enjoy it so much. So lots of, oh yeah, weight training, Pilates, cardio, all sorts of different things. Great. So you can keep them coming and no problem. I can watch badminton. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, Jen mentioned there's some good badminton players in the group. Terrific. Uh, my own personal sports I enjoy. I'm a runner. I like doing yoga. I did play basketball growing up. Not as good as the guys I play with. Um, and then I've played a whole bunch of other sports going through the years. And I look forward to getting back to them as COVID hopefully eases a little bit. Oh, we got some golfers. I was going to say, where are the golfers in the group? So that's uh, that gives us a, a good uh, some good context to start. 
So what I'm going to do now is share my screen. Okay, so you'll be able to see my slides and I'm gonna make these available to you after the presentation. So you can certainly take a picture as you're going if you want for immediate, uh, to be able to immediately refer back to it if you wanna share something, but ooh, sailing, that's amazing. I've only had one chance to sail and uh, it was remarkable. Um, but you will get the slides afterwards. So don't worry, you don't have to memorize everything. I've got some science in here. I'm gonna be straight with you. Um, I understand that you are a pretty serious group in terms of your sport sports and your activities. And so, you know, Jen and I talked and we could have done a nutrition overview presentation, but we actually decided to do one that I've had some fun with the last few years that I've been doing increasingly for corporate client groups um, that are interested in dealing with all of the controversies around nutrition and sport nutrition. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I will share my screen now and we will get going. And Jen, if there's any problems with seeing my oops, slides, of course, you can let me know. So I think we're looking good. You can give me a thumbs up, Jen. Yeah, okay, awesome. So uh, the topic we're going to talk about tonight then is making sense of nutrition trends, or you could say controversies. Five hot, it just takes up too much space to say controversies. Five hot topics in sport nutrition. So what I'm going to do is walk through five different topics. And um, we're going to break down each one. And these are each starting with a question or sort of a, a maybe a myth or something that's being commonly said about sport nutrition these days, and then we're going to break it down. Uh, feel like I said, feel free to ask questions in the chat function as we go along. This is a, a nice um, intimate group, so we can we can make the time to answer them as we go. Okay, so the five questions we're going to talk about today are: Do I need to go keto? Um, and that's going to be a discussion around carbs. Is it okay if I fast before I work out? Sports drinks are just junk, right? Which is one that I get a lot and there's a lot of assumptions around, around that. Should I take a protein shake after I work out? And how much protein do I really need for whatever it is I'm doing in life? Now, before we do this, um, I'm gonna ask anybody who has their phone handy, it's really, usually we say when we're doing a presentation, we want you to put your phones down. I'm gonna do something really uncommon and ask you to pick your phones up if you have one, if you have an iPad, if you have something handy where you can browse the web. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna break from my slides for one quick second, and I'm gonna ask you to go to a website. And that website is called menti.com, okay? menti.com. I'm just going to um, leave the full screen version of this right now because you can't see the code. There we go there. What I want you to do when you go to menti.com, you do not need to enter any personal information. You don't need to be a member of this website. You don't need to do anything other than just go to it and you'll see a code at the top of your screen there. 3799 0264. Enter that in in the space provided, and you'll see this question below. And this is one I like to ask all the groups that I start with, which is, you know, from time to time, some of us feel that we see some conflicting nutrition information out there. So you can go in there and you should be able to enter that code and then answer which one applies to you. Yes, and it drives me bananas. Meh, not so much. Or oh, no, I've totally got this. It makes 100% sense to me with a hair flip going along with that. So right now we've got uh, a strong lead from the yes and it drives me bananas. We have a few people who are a bit more relaxed about it, which I give you credit for. Nobody's gone with the 100% makes sense to me yet. I think we've got about half the participants so far and you don't have to join in if you don't want to by all means, but it's a nice way to start um, any discussion about nutrition because the challenge I have is that I spend a lot of my time dealing with information and misinformation. So as you can see here, we've got a little bit of a, of a lead here on the, oh, you guys say one thing one day and then you seem to course correct and say something different the other day, but there's nobody here who says, yeah, I've got it all down pat. So let's pause. Oh, we got one more vote for the bananas there at the very end. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And if you wanna keep voting, that's no problem, but I'm gonna flip back to our slides. Okay. so. Each of these topics that I just mentioned that we're going to talk about are, whoops, Elizabeth's iPad is drawing on. How is that happening? Can you see that, the iPad drawings? I have no idea how that's happening, <laughs> but I'm not doing that. <laughs> Someone is uh, somehow drawing little yellow lines over my presentation. Magic. But each of these speak to some of the nutrition controversies that we deal with every day. And so we're going to walk through those and break them down. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about today is a little bit around the discussion around the role of carbohydrates in performance. And I'm using the word, do I need to use keto or sorry, do I need to go keto as a little bit of, a, of a, an exaggeration? But what I do get a lot of questions about is, do carbs have anything to do with performance? Can I eat a low carb diet or restrict my carbohydrate intake and be the best athlete I want to be in whatever sport that might be, be it sailing or badminton or Pilates? And this all comes from this notion that's come um, a lot bigger in the fitness realm and sport nutrition realm in the last 10 years or so, that this idea that if you cut carbs down or you cut them all the way out of your diet, your body will become a more efficient fat burner. And that if we do that, that that's going to allow us uh, basically to get the same benefit from our sport, but without all of the potentially negative benefits of eating all those carbs. So is there truth to this? Is there not? Let's see. Okay, so what you're gonna see, I'm just gonna get rid of my little images here on the side. Um, tonight, I'm gonna use the, these two words an awful lot and those are, that depends, okay? And that's what this is all going to be about tonight is understanding customization and personalization for each of you, that's important. So the first thing I'm going to ask any client of mine or any athlete I work with, if they say, what should I do? Should I, I'm eating a low carb diet or I'm really trying to watch and not eat a lot of rice and I've cut out bread and I'm not eating potatoes anymore. Uh, am I doing the best I can for my sport? And I would say, well, it depends on your goals. So are you in it for general health, maybe weight management or disease prevention? So what I would call the everyday active person, somebody who is just uh, enjoying being active for all of its overall benefits. Or are you like this gentleman here and you're trying to uh, train for a personal best? So you are competing, maybe mostly against yourself, but you want to maybe get a best time. Maybe you want to cycle the Pyrenees Mountains for the first time. Maybe you want to do a distance in, in a running race or a triathlon you've de never done before. Maybe you're looking to improve in the tennis ladder and become a better player. Then we have some individuals who are literally training to be the best. I happen to work with those down here in, in uh, Tampa with the Raptors right now, as well as the teams I work with with the national team. So their goals are different. They are literally here not just to compete against themselves, but to beat the person beside them in the lane or on the court or on the ice. And then there's these guys here. So let's <laughs> be aware that there's certainly people who are there to look their best or they're training for physique. And that's okay too, to say, hey, I'm here because I want to see my abs pop out, or I want to see if I can get that muscle to jump out for the first time that I've never seen before. And that's all right. Um, but essentially each one of these different groups, and you may identify with one or more of them, might have a slightly different answer to each of the questions that I'm posing today. So what are our goals? So uh, let's talk a little bit about, this is going to be my biggest, heaviest physiology slide. So physiology refers to the science of how the body works, okay? And then it'll get much easier after this. But I think this is such a great slide. It's from a classic paper going back over 20 years that looked at the different fuel sources that our body uses, depending on the intensity of the activity that we're doing. So if you go along the lower axis, the x-axis of our graph, you'll see that it starts on the left at 25% of maximal oxygen uptake and goes all the way over to 85. And basically what the researchers undertaking the study did is they demonstrated within the body which fuel sources do we use depending on how intensely we're moving. So down on the left side at 25% of maximal oxygen uptake, we would be doing very, very little, super light activity, essentially going from sitting to a very slow walk, and that would be about it. As we progress to the right and we hit maybe 65% of maximum oxygen uptake, also known as percent VO2 max, more or less, if we started to progress over there towards the right, we start to burn more fuel overall, but you'll notice that there's a change in the type of fuel that we burn. So I've got four different types of fuel on the right here. Importantly, two of them have yellow arrows beside them. We have muscle glycogen. What is that? Glycogen is carbohydrates stored in the muscle. On the bottom, we have what's called plasma glucose. What the heck is that? That's blood sugar. Okay, the two in the middle are called muscle triglycerides and something called plasma free fatty acids. Yikes, what does that mean? Those are fats. Muscle triglycerides are fat in the muscle because believe it or not, there is a little fat in there for everyone and fat in the bloodstream, also known as plasma FFA. So what we have are four different options that our body can use at any given moment, depending on how hard we are exercising or training or competing. 
So we can use carb in our muscle, the glycogen, carb in our bloodstream, the glucose, fat in our bloodstream or fat in our muscle. And as you start to spend some time looking at this, I think you'll notice a few things. You'll notice that as the activity you're doing becomes more intense and goes all the way up to 85% of your maximal effort, you start using proportionately more carbs. You start burning more of your glycogen and you start burning more blood sugar. And you actually start using less fat within especially your bloodstream, but to a certain degree within your muscles. And the reason for this is simple. Our body is only so efficient at burning fat for fuel. That's a really important sport nutrition concept that gets often overlooked. There is a limit to the speed that our body can break down fat and turn it into energy. And as you can see here, that limit seems to occur somewhere around 65% of our maximal effort. Now, what does that feel like? That's about a slow, well, not slow sorry, that's about a steady jog or maybe a run or sorry, a bike ride, forgive me, at a steady state where you can easily hold on to a conversation where you feel like you could go for a, quite a long time, where the perceived level of exertion is decent, but not unbearable. As you start to get higher, as the intensity goes up and you're feeling breathless or you're starting to feel like things are really getting hard for you, that's when you're flipping into really, really burning through carbs fast. So you may be able to see already why I'm saying the answer to should I be eating carbs to support my sport or do I really not need them? Well, it depends. Where is the intensity of the sport you're participating in? And only you can answer that question right now or with the trainers that you're working with. You guys could sit down after the session and say, where do you think I fall? And if most of your work is 65% or lower, then you can see carbs are not that critical to your performance. But if you're doing big, heavy stuff, a lot of hit training, or you're playing singles tennis and you're going all out and you're way up on the ladder, or if you're trying to compete at a high level in a running race or a triathlon, then you darn well are going to need some carbohydrates to support those highly active, intense activities. And just to point out that at the highest level of sport, elite marathoners burn 85% of their calories when they're running from carbs and only 15% from fat. So if they don't earn car eat carbs, they are not going to succeed in their sport. They will be slow. Okay, that's it. That's all the physiology. Okay, everybody can relax. So let's put this another way. Let's think about performance. So a few years ago, the Australian Institute of Sport, which is the greatest sport institute in the world, performed a study called Supernova. And in that Supernova study, they took elite race walkers and no one ever make fun of race walkers because they're faster than pretty much all um, casual and recreational and even some competitive runners. And they gave them different amount of carbs in their diet. They gave some of them sufficient carbs, which means a high carb diet for those race walkers. Some of them, they gave them some high carb, some low called periodized. And the other ones went on a ketogenic diet. So they went on an LCHF or low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. And they did that for a three week training camp. And then they did a literal competition that was sanctioned through the world track and field body. So there was a lot of incentive to, for these guys to give their very, very best. And again, they trained for three weeks prior to that competition on one of those three diets. And then they competed. So what happened? Okay, so let's walk through this graph a little bit. So high CHO on the, or HCHO on the bottom is the high carb group. PCHO are the ones who consumed high carbs sometimes. And sometimes when the training wasn't as intense, they reduced it. And the LCHF are the group that went keto. The white bars on the left of each group is the time it took them to complete 10 kilometers. Now, those of you who know you're running, you're going to be impressed because you'll realize that these guys were competing, completing 10K walking in about 45 minutes at the start of the training camp. Um, that's bananas uh, at a walking pace. And then they, they generally got faster as the camp went on, which makes sense. You're at a training camp against the best in the world. You should get faster. But look at the group on the right. The low carb, high fat group started their training camp at an equal overall speed for the 10K as their peers. But after three weeks of a ketogenic diet and then racing, they were the only group that got slower. They got 23 seconds slower after three weeks of training their brains out versus the high carb and the periodized carb group, the ones who consumed high carbs sometimes. So this was pretty remarkable evidence that said, hang on a second, if you really restrict your carbs and you want to go fast, you may not be able to go as fast as you'd like. 
So these, at least in terms of these world-class athletes, it demonstrated pretty clearly that if we don't have sufficient carbs in our diet, we're going to struggle. And as I said, maybe even become slower. Uh, if you're wondering, well, is that just a one-off? These same results have been repeated three more times in the past three years with different athletes. So why are the keto folks not performing so well? What's going on here? Those who've done some reading on low carb diets might hear about a term called fat adaptation. What does that mean? It means that if you ate a low carb diet for a long time, does your body become more efficient at using carb for fuel? That's what some people would say. But in fact, they measured the fat burning capacity of these low carb athletes and they burned a ton of fat and they were still slower. In fact, they set a world record for how much fat these guys burned and they still got slower. And the reason for that is because we know that carbohydrates are the fastest burning fuel source. That data and evidence has been out there since the 1920s and there's no reason to believe that our physiology has changed it. So at the end of the day, we know if your goal on this presentation is speed or explosiveness, if you need to maximize your effort, there's a good chance that going low carb is going to potentially hurt your performance more than it's gonna improve it. Now, having said that, is there any other benefit to being on a low carb or ketogenic diet? And there possibly is, there's some evidence you can maintain your strength, but maybe a bit of a hard time putting on muscle. And then there's the question of potentially whether it helps with weight loss. So here's a tree for you that I've, I've made up that helps you to be able to make a decision for yourself about where carbs fit. So you can ask yourself this question, do I need to be able to do short bursts of high speed or intensity? And if the answer is yes, then I think you should be eating some carbs before and after, at the very least, your hardest workouts. What kind of carbs? I have some slides coming up, but things like it might be some fruit at minimum, but yeah, maybe even some starchy carbs. They've got a bad rap, but believe it or not, some toast or some rice or some sweet potato or some oats might do the trick. Or you can enjoy carbs as part of your regular diet. So in other words, not feeling you restrict them to just before and after your workouts. Many people can do just fine with that too. On the other hand, if you're not, if this isn't a priority for you, then go ahead. If you want to restrict carbohydrates, that's no problem. If the work you're doing is mostly medium intensity and you find you feel better with a low carb diet, great. And that's what this slide shows you then is if, and again, and I keep saying keto, but that really could just be a carb restricted diet is depending on what your particular goals are, you can decide for yourself. All right, if you wanna go low carb because you think it's gonna help with your everyday health, fine. If you think it's gonna help you be faster, I would argue against that. If, if you think it's gonna help you to win, definitely not. And if you're doing it for weight loss, maybe, maybe it would. But there's some folks on this call who will probably use it as a tool for things like blood sugar control, maybe mental focus and to control cravings. And if that's the most important thing to you then a low carb diet makes sense. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. So if there's any questions as we go along, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to jump. Why eat carbs after workout? Okay, Marguerite, that's a great question. So you know what? I'm going to hold off on that because we're going to talk about that in a couple slides. Okay, but keep the questions coming. Okay, so is it okay to if I fast before I work out? So this is one I get maybe more than any other question, which is, excuse me, do I need to be... Um, eating something before I work out. And you bet you can already guess what my answer is going to be. <laughs> when I started in my career, I definitely erred on the side of saying everybody should be eating something in the morning. We should all be eating breakfast, but I've definitely changed my tune, tune as time has gone on. So there it is. My answer is ready for it. What are your goals? It depends. Are you after the same things that we've already talked about before? General health. I love our little yellow squiggly lines. I don't know how we get rid of those, but somebody else got control of this presentation and drew those in. <laughs> I can't get rid of them. So we'll just enjoy them for the rest of the talk. Uh, it depends on your goals, whether or not you're going to eat before you're going to work out or train or play tennis or whatever. So let's ask ourselves, why? Why would we eat before we participate in sport or workout? And there's two big things. If we eat and if we presumably eat some carbs, which we've already heard have some value, what is it giving for us? Well, you've already heard that it's providing your working muscles with a fuel source and the higher the intensity, the, the activity, the more that it's going to burn through our carbs in our body. But the other one not to be overlooked is the role that glucose pray, plays in brain function. And this is a big one because if we have low blood sugar, it's more difficult for our brain to make spontaneous decisions. And some of those decisions are ones we don't even realize we're making. 
So what we tend to see is more error and also not just because of error, more risk of injury. So for example, there's research out there that suggests that gymnasts who train on the balance beam with low blood sugar are more likely to suffer falls during training. There's evidence that people who ski with low blood sugar are more likely to suffer an injury like an ACL tear. But there's also research to say that if you participate in a decision oriented sport, um, and I would argue tennis has a lot of uh, immediate decisions that are required. If your blood sugar is low or you don't have sufficient carbohydrate for your brain to process, the odds of you making mistakes go up. So we see things like free throw percentage in basketball go down. And we see shot accuracy in soccer also go down. I haven't seen data on tennis per se, but it seems to me that it makes a lot of sense that your likelihood of making an error goes up if you haven't got sufficient carbohydrate in your body or glucose for your brain to think. Now for everyone out there though, depending on which sport or activity you're participating in, if you have low blood sugar, we know your activity tends to feel harder. So if you decide to get up in the morning and do a ride without eating anything before you start, that ride is probably going to feel a little bit more difficult for you or putting it in another way, flip it around. If you ride and you've eaten well, it's probably going to feel easier for you. We also know that when we haven't eaten, our speed and our intensity that we voluntarily choose tends to go down. So you may be less likely to choose to go to that um, zone five if you're a heart rate working type of person. That may be less likely for you to get to that place. And if that matters to you for what you want to get out of your sport, then maybe you want more opportunity to to go to that highest heart rate. And then as I've already indicated, poor cognitive function and decision-making, which again, not only could lead to mistakes, but injury. Now, some will point out and say, but I've heard that fasted workouts lead to more fat burning. I wanna burn fat because I wanna improve my physique. Well, the first thing I'd say is that fat burning that you hear about maybe on Instagram or you've uh, seen in the media, the difference in fat burning for a fasted workout versus one where you've, you've eaten is really small, like scientifically barely detectable. Some argue at the highest level of sport that that might lead to some good changes in your body over time. You might become a more uh, aerobic athlete over time. In other words, a runner who does fasted workouts or a triathlete or a swimmer who does fasted workouts might actually develop more endurance over time, that's possible. The research is really hit and miss on that, but maybe. But the main thing I wanna let you know is that when the studies are done on this, you really can't detect any benefit to a fasted workout. If the workouts are short, anything less than 40 minutes, you really can't even tell the difference in, in terms of increased fat oxidation or aerobic capacity over time in any of the studies that are out there that usually last about three months or so. So in other words, if you're saying, hey, I wanna fast because I think it's gonna make me a better athlete somehow, the answer is, if it is, we can barely even measure it. So that it, the difference would be so slight that I would say it's only relevant for the most elite athletes. And for the rest of us, it's not going to make you a better athlete. Now, on the other hand, could it help with things like weight loss? And that research says it could, not because necessarily you're becoming a more efficient fat burner, but because you're delaying your meals and trying to almost embrace an intermittent fasting approach. So if that's your goal, then maybe you do want to delay and not eat breakfast before you train. But again, this all depends on what your goals are. So let's, let's ask ourselves that question. What do you want to get out of your workout? What do you want to get out of your sailing session or your badminton uh, match or your Pilates session? If the workout you're doing is high intensity or it's really important to you, you want to get the most out of it, You've, you're paying your trainer, you're paying your coach, and you want to show up and you want to give your all, then I'm telling you, you will do better if you've eaten. And in general, we would want it to be something carb-based. Um, if you don't have much time, it could just be something little. If you have more time, though, then I would throw in some protein and fat. And I'll show you that in one second. On the other hand, if it doesn't matter, if you see, I'll tell you about myself. I'd rather just get out there in the morning. I'm not going to eat before a run at 630 in the morning. I just, and I'm not here to win. I just want to get my run in. So, of course, I fast. So, that's fine. And sometimes my stomach's growling. I don't like that. But all that.
5k run, then I will get up a little earlier and I will eat some oatmeal before I go because I don't want my stomach growling and I don't want it to feel unpleasant. Uh, Jenny, can you just give me a quick thing in the chat? Can you hear me okay? It just gave me an internet is unstable message. Are we good? Can everybody hear me? Can somebody let me know? Yeah, okay, Jenny. Yep. We're good? Okay. All yep, right. You're great. So the question was, what kind of carbs? Great question. So this is, um, oh, one more slide, and then I'll show you the different carb examples. So what should you eat? Okay, so this breaks this down into visual for the visual learners in the group. So what you're going to eat, it really depends, as you've heard it the three times, it's context dependent on how much time you have before you start. So this shows that graphically. So if you can eat a few hours in advance, the meal or the snack itself can be bigger. So the overall size can be larger. Uh, you have more time to digest it and access all the nutrients and not have it sit in your stomach and make you feel sick. On the other hand, if it's say the morning and you're getting up and going right to your training session or getting right on your bike, then you need the, that overall amount of food probably to be smaller so that it doesn't upset your stomach and so you can actually um, digest as much of it as possible. Okay. And then there's lands in between. The next thing is, can you have some protein and some fat? And the answer is, yeah, sure you can, but they digest slower than carbs do. And again, they don't provide us with available energy. So you use them more to keep your appetite even. Particular can be really slow to digest and can leave us feeling kind of a little meh, uh, a little sick potentially. Uh, the other thing I will warn you about is fiber, which you may have already experienced this. If you eat a lot of fiber and then go and uh, do something really, really intense, the situation can get, shall we say, explosive, which I've experienced before, um, eating a large amount of chili. And that chili was still there the next morning with all of the beans having opinions. And uh, I thought things were going to get, uh, you know, rather... Um, newspaper worthy, but it, it did work out okay. But we do want to be careful with fiber because it is gassy and, um, and it does uh, unfortunately lead to digestive changes that can be unpleasant. Okay, so let's visualize this. So the question was, what kind of carbs are we talking about, Jen? So if we go in sequential order, our lowest carb carb foods are non-starchy vegetables. So things like broccoli and spinach and zucchinis and bell peppers and so on. From there, we progress into fruits, um, of all kinds, and you could break that down to say berries at the low end and bananas at the higher end, okay. From there we go into starchy vegetables, like things like uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes, and also starchy uh, grains, things like rice, quinoa, oats, um, and breads, and so on. So again, and I'm going to show you an image in a minute about the carb content of some of these different foods and how much carbs in each of them, but the idea is the more time you have and the more carb you can eat and the more that you need it for that workout, the more you want, might want it to be a starchy carb. So that might be, you can see the difference here where I've said peanut butter with maybe a banana or an apple might work for you. But if you need more carb, then maybe put in a slice of toast or maybe one of the nice breakfast pitas that are out there or even half a bagel. That's okay. Don't be afraid of it. Um, on the other hand, if you some, you know, if it's if you don't have much time before you're starting to train, then maybe you just put half a banana and a few berries for your carb in a smoothie, and that might be all that you can tolerate, and that's fine. Um, or maybe it's a little bit of oatmeal. Like I said, that works really well for me before my long runs. Oh no. What has happened? We good? Okay. <laughs> so I can you get rid of your squiggles for you, Jen? Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay. Can you, oh, that's great. Yay. Look at that. Um, so can everybody still see my screen? We cool. You got to share again. Oh, I do. Okay. All right. That's happened to me a couple of times when I'm doing talks where I, Sorry, I, no, no, that's not, that was I thought we had, I told her to clear the whiteboard and I think it booted you out. That was yeah. exciting though. Those yellow squiggles anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was super exciting. Okay. There we go. Um, so again, you know, I've got a little bit of toast in here, I, a little bit of a carb, you, you might be amazed if you've really cut those out of your diet, you might be shocked. I can't tell you how much, how many times people come back to me. They're like, I had a bit of toast before my tennis match and I felt really good. I'm like you don't need to feel guilty about that. It's okay. You're giving your body the fuel it needs to be able to perform well. Um, and so things like dried fruit, that could be another portable idea. If you're going, you know, one day we will be busy again. 
if you're going from A to B and you need that for your carb. The underlined foods on this slide are your protein foods. We'll talk about those more in a second, but that's things like nuts or yogurts, um, peanut butter. You'll see I don't have a lot of meat on this slide and that's because I'm assuming that you don't have a lot of time to digest that and those might just be a bit heavy. And again, a reminder that you'll get all these slides. You don't have to memorize these. On the other hand, if you have a bit more time, then these might be, and I didn't put the portions on here because they're going to be different depending on your unique needs. Um, but you can do something more complex, like a chicken with rice and veggies kind of meal, or you could do a wrap or maybe a heavier, higher protein bar, or in your smoothie, not just banana and berries, but throwing in maybe some oats in there um, for more carb, a little bit of peanut in there, or peanut butter, I'm sorry, or almond butter in there for a little bit of fat or fiber. So you can see we're just enriching the size of those meals to make them more, a little bit more robust and to be able to fill us up a little bit more and give us more carb for usable energy. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that particular topic. We've talked a lot about sort of the role of carbohydrates in performance. I'm going to talk a little bit about hydration now. Anybody have any questions at this point? You can feel free to type them in the, in the chat and I'll, I'll answer them as we go along. Don't hesitate to. Now we're going to talk about um, hydration and sports drinks because this is one that when I started, you know, there was a lot of push for sports drinks as being, you know, a great option. And now because of the fears of sugar, people are moving away from them with great speed. So let's, before we talk about what a sports drink might do, let's talk about the bigger picture of hydration or dehydration. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the notion that dehydration has its issues. Um, here's some examples of the issues that dehydration can cause. It can increase your heart rate, which can then increase what's called your RPE or rate of perceived exertion. In other words, it makes you feel like you're working harder. Uh, it can reduce your aerobic capacity. So it makes it um, just physically more difficult to do the work you're doing. And then some physical effects like has it headache, nausea, or even cramping or impaired GI or gastrointestinal function. In other words, stomach function. So some people um, have a harder time getting food through their body when they're doing a triathlon or a marathon if they're dehydrated and they need to get fuel in. Now, the American College of Sports Medicine gave us some guidelines on hydration because I get the question a lot, how much should I drink? And the answer that they gave was really a difficult one to put into practice, but kind of elegant and simple at the same time. And that was drink according to thirst. Great. <laughs> the problem with that is that gives me nothing that I can give you that's a number. So do we all do a good job of this? Debatable. Some people have better thirst sense sensors than others. Some people pay attention and others do not. So it's a bit of a tricky one. But what we do know is if a person struggles with dehydration or they're just, you know, not in the habit of using fluids during their sport, that if you add a little bit of flavor, if you add even a little bit of salt, and believe it or not, if you add color to a drink, you will drink more. People just like it when their drink has color to it. And they're more, you may have noticed that, that if you have like an infused water, you drink more than if it's just a plain water. So if you can imagine that you're someone who struggles with dehydration, you might be a person for whom adding a little bit of zest So from my point of view then, Water is what we want to use most of the time. I'm not here to sell you guys on sports drinks, but what I am saying is every so often, don't be totally afraid of it. If you're in a situation where it's hot or humid or unusually so, like maybe what's happening right now in Toronto, where all of a sudden the temperature's gone up, you might have a harder time hydrating sufficiently for your activity if the, it, when your body hasn't had time to get used to it. That might be a time to add a little bit of something, which I'll show you in a second, to your drink instead of just drinking water. The other group who might need um, a little bit of carb is anybody doing really hard training over about 90 minutes. So if you're a cyclist or a triathlete and you're doing rides of, you know, two and three hours or more, which I know a lot of people do, uh, you might need to start adding something to your water instead of just hydrating with plain water. And I fight people at the highest levels of sport all the way up to the Olympic level to make these changes. Ironman triathletes I had in my office who've had issues with um, fueling and dehydration. And sometimes it's incredibly simple changes that help them to get their performance on track. Now, here's another one that people often don't think of. If you're already tired or dehydrated. So if you already did a workout, maybe you did a weight workout and now you're going out and playing some tennis, 
that might be a time to add a little bit of carb or a little bit of something to your to your water to get a, a little bit of a of pep, a little bit of a pick me up when your body's already depleted. And then another option is if you haven't eaten. So again, if you don't have that carb in your body, this might be an opportunity to get that. Um, and then the last one is for my my hardcore athletes in the group here. If you have anybody in the group who uh, does compete in running races or triathlon and you want to be able to get a little performance boost at the very, very end of your race, believe it or not, there's new research that says if you swish a sports drink around in your mouth and spit it out, you'll get a performance benefit which I think is pretty wild um, without even swallowing it because your brain gets a message that says, Oh, the carbs are coming. Amazing. Let's go faster. I don't do that with many athletes, but I do get people from time to time who are like, Oh, if I have to drink any more during that run or that race, I'm going to puke. Then these are the ones who can get a benefit from this right at the very end, which is kind of fun. Now I was saying, what can we put in this? Okay. Am I going to be a shill for Gatorade right now? And the answer is no, not at all. But what you might do is you might take one part of what I call usually a red juice. Um, so something like pomegranate or cranberry juice, even tart cherry juice is quite popular um, in two to three parts water, roughly. Don't, don't overthink it, but basically a splash of it in your water and add about an eighth of a teaspoon of salt in your water bottle. And you know what you've just made? Gatorade, basically. So that's a billion dollar industry. So if you're seeing any of the above five uh, little bullet points fits for you, then you might want to make this little homemade sports drink. You can also do the same thing with honey or maple syrup. And the idea is to just put a bit of carb in there and a bit of salt. And all of a sudden you'll drink more. You'll replace some of the electrolytes you lose in your sweat. And you'll also give your body a little bit more carb to, as a pick me up, both psychologically and physically. All right. Um, now, I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about the carbs during a workout. And I see we have a couple of chat questions. So let's see. Oh, Marguerite, how do we know? Yeah, how much hydration does an active person need? And unfortunately, Marguerite, the answer is we drink according to thirst. I can't tell you because your sweat rate is unique. Now, if you are interested and you really want to get serious about this, you can measure your hydration or dehydration. And the way that you do that, if you want to write this down, is before you do a training session, you weigh yourself and you weigh yourself, but go pee beforehand. Make a note of any fluids that you did drink like water or sports drink during. If you lose more than two to 3% of your body weight during your training session, then you may have been dehydrated enough that you could have seen your performance decline. What does that mean? It means for every uh, 100 pounds a person weighs, if you lose more than two to three pounds of weight, that's not body fat, everyone. I'm sorry to tell you that is uh, water weight. That's sweat rate. If you lose that, then you're, for better or for worse, going to potentially see your performance decline and you're becoming significantly dehydrated. Okay. So if you want to do that, you can um, go for it. And, and I do have some um, people are interested. I have an Excel spreadsheet that you can calculate this stuff if you really want to. But a simple way, like I said, is just weigh yourself before and after in as little clothing as you can legally do without getting into trouble. Um, and, uh, and see whether your weight loss exceeds two to three pounds for every hundred pounds that you weigh. Okay. So that would be three to four and a half pounds for 150 pound person, uh, or four to six pounds for someone who's, who's 200 pounds. Okay. Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, as for the rest of the day, everyone says, how much water should I drink? And I'm like, it just depends. It depends. You want your pee to generally be, you know, clear to straw. Like I'm sure you've heard that many times, unless you're taking B vitamins, and beyond that, you're kind of just giving your kidneys more of a workout than they need. I think the water thing, I hate to say, it, has been a little overstated. The idea that we have to be drowning ourselves in water all day long is, is a bit of a myth. Okay, so I hope that helps. Uh, love to see that spreadsheet. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've got one question asking. Um, you can contact at the end of this and I can send you that spreadsheet if you want it. Okay, so do we need to take carbs during a workout? Um, and so this is the complex and gnarly um, position stand from the uh, Dietitians of Canada and the American um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So what I'm trying to show you here is that once again, it depends. <laughs> Do I need to look screen, but basically what you'll see at the top, do I need carbs during my workout? And it says during brief exercise, during sustained high intensity exercise. So the kind of stuff we've already 
talked about 45 to 75 minutes or more, you might, including that maybe even that mouth rinse we talked about. On the other hand, if we're getting past an hour and going all the way up to two hours of pretty hardcore stuff, your performance will go up if 30 to 60 grams of carbs per hour. What does that look like? Each banana is about 25 or so grams of carbs. So one to two bananas an hour per hour, not just right after hour one, but if you go all the way to two hours, you'd need about the equivalent of say one to two bananas to be able to still perform at your best. Okay. And then if you're going all the way up into ultra endurance, then that's a whole other matter. And then we would potentially benefit from up to three bananas an hour or the equivalent. Now, if you don't want to do bananas, that's fine. I've got some other pictures of carbs that you can use. So everything from other fruit like oranges, um, I've got things like coconut water there. I've got dates or um, fig bars, I should say. Dates would be another great option. But even things like crackers are fine. I use error cookies a lot. Um, and then for cyclists and some of the hardcore athletes that are really going out there, um, even things like cold baked potatoes are a great option. You'll see I don't have gels on here, but they're certainly an option. But I'm trying to give you food-based alternatives versus using a gel. But a gel can work for higher intensity, longer lasting activity. But again, this is really for people doing pretty heavy workloads. So yeah, if you're in a five set tennis match that's going on for five hours, you can darn well bet you're going to want to have some carbs. But if you're out there for an hour playing doubles and enjoying your time and you ate beforehand, you don't need it. Okay. See how many times I'm going to say that depends. Doesn't it drive you nuts? Goodness gracious. Okay. So let's shift gears. We're going to stop talking about carbs finally, and we're going to talk about protein. So do I need a protein shake after working out? And if there are any questions from these last two ses uh, sessions, don't, or sections, I should say, don't hesitate to ask. Um, do I need a protein shake? You know, based on the belief that maybe taking a protein shake will help me to get ripped. Okay. So how much protein do we need? Do we need a protein shake? And let's just walk through this a little bit, what happens when we train or when we lift. So the first thing to know is if you lift some muscle, if you do some kind of, or lift some muscle, sorry, if you use your muscles to lift or you do some kind of resistance training, your body does see a benefit to muscle building that lasts up to two full days, which I think is great. So this uh, little slide here illustrates that. So it basically says that if I've done a workout, um, or exercise EX, which is the dotted line here, my body will increase the rate of something called MPS, which is a fancy word for muscle protein synthesis, also meaning muscle building. That will go up after I've trained. And you can see on its own, it will take up to 48 full hours for it to decline back to normal. So you will literally build muscle for two days after a workout, even if you don't eat any protein. Pretty powerful. On the other hand, the little, almost look, look like little, little cups or little pill bottles that you see indicate up uh, eating protein. And if we eat protein, every time we do, we get a spike in muscle building. So muscle uh, resistance training on its own builds muscle, but resistance training combined with protein does it doubly so. And we know building and maintaining muscle is one of the most important things we can do for healthy aging and also to help us perform at our best. So as I've said, it's not just the training, it's the protein in concert. So now, on the other hand, am I now saying that everybody on this call needs to be like chugging protein shakes? And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't use them myself. I don't train hard enough or consistently enough to need that. So going back to this, if you don't want to do a protein shake, the research has shown clearly that if you eat a normal mixed meal, so something with some tofu or some chicken or some salmon, some steak, um, yogurt or Greek yogurt, after your workout, even up to two hours afterwards, for most workouts or training sessions, can provide enough protein to help you um, make this little pulse of muscle building happen. So mo for most of us, um, eating regularly at regular intervals without any protein shakes or super hardcore recovery principles is enough. Okay. You don't, the worst thing I hate is when somebody goes and does like a 30 minute workout or an hour of something less intense, like yoga or Pilates, and then they turn around and they eat like, you know, a five, 900 calorie protein shake. That's really unnecessary. Okay. So are there people who do need protein? Are there people who, who benefit from a protein shake? 
So if you um, want to think about your protein overall, and we'll finish by talking about daily protein needs, um, I'm going to use the same number as I use here to help you figure out how much protein you need after a workout. And again, remember, you can get this from food, or yes, you can use a protein shake. And as long as it's within two hours, you're okay. If you really need to recover fast, then make that interval shorter and eat within, say, 30 minutes or so. So you have to know yourself and how, again, what your goals are. So, but in general, we're recommending about 0.3 grams of protein per kilo body weight. So I've done the math for you. For most of you, that's going to be between 18 and 25 grams of protein in the post-workout phase. That will give you as much muscle building potential as you can get. So ideally, we want that within about two hours, as I said, of finishing your workout if you're going to train again within the next two days. However, if you're hard hardcore and your recovery time is really short so say if you're doing something in from the night to the next morning so say you did you played tennis one night and then the next morning you're going to go and do a workout then yeah get your protein in faster let's speed that recovery up let's get rid of some of that muscle damage or if you know that the workouts you're doing are really really hard so if you've done again a long three hour bike ride on, on a Sunday, then please get that protein into your body as quick as you possibly can so that we can reduce the amount of recovery time your body needs. What kind of protein? We know that whey, which is uh, the protein from milk um, that you see in a lot of protein supplements, it works really, really well. It is the fastest acting protein out there. So it speeds recovery more efficiently than anything, but food is fine too. So eggs, milk, beef work really well. They've all been studied, but there's more research saying that plant proteins work as well. So um, this is just an example of that, of comparing milk to whey protein, um, to a soy protein and increases in lean mass, which is a fancy word for muscle mass versus just carb alone. And you can see soy still resulted in an increase in muscle mass at all. Um, do you need carbs? The question was, do you need a carb after you train in the, which I think Marguerite asked earlier. And the answer is not for muscle building, but for recovering your energy sources in your, in your muscle. So remember I said the glycogen in your muscle. Yeah. Carb will help with that. So you'll have energy to train tomorrow. Okay. So our last question of the day then is how much protein do I need in a day? So, and again, the idea being some people are saying we're eating too much protein. Some people are saying we're not eating enough protein and that's a bad thing. And either way, they're saying it's killing us. So how much protein do we really need? Well, for better or for worse, I think everyone in this call is probably over 20. Um, and so then I have bad news for you. You are all losing muscle. So am I also known. We might call that fat-free mass or FFM over our lives. So the average person you can see um, is, is seeing a decline in muscle building over time. Is that correctable? Can we fix that or slow that down? And the answer is we think we can. How much protein do we need then to preserve fat-free mass or muscle? And this is the really the study that got everyone talking that showed that the recommended intake for protein is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. It's all the way over on the left. But look what happens when we increase our protein intake past that, all the way up to double, 1.6 grams of protein per kilo per day. They showed really clear evidence. This is research out of McMaster University, good Canadian research, that you doubling your protein intake leads your body to produce more muscle. And that's great for all of us for healthy aging and performance. So we know now that yes, to prevent, you know, deficiency and, and frailty, maybe 0.8 grams of protein per kilo would do that. But we've learned now we need something probably more than that for optimal health, not to mention for recovery and performance. So what does 1.6 grams of protein per kilo per day look like? Uh, for a lot of people, that's going to be somewhere between about 100 to about 150 grams of protein per day. But I prefer to divide it up by meal. Oops, here we go. Um, so this was the old school thinking was just get enough protein over the course of the day. Doesn't matter how you split it up. As long as you get it, you're fine. The new school is we're saying that we actually do better when we get our protein in even doses or pulses roughly every four hours throughout the day. So getting somewhere, as I've already said, between say 0.3 and 0.4 grams of protein per kilo per meal, which is about 20 ish grams of protein for most folks out there. Okay, um, so let me show you what that looks like. So the pulsing of protein helps us to build more muscle over time. So this slide helps you to see a whole bunch of different protein foods. 
So again, if about 20 to 25 grams will do the trick, Hey, everyone, I'm just going to see if Jen's going to come back. We'll just give it just a second there, okay? <laughs> Thanks for your patience. She is frozen. She knows it. <laughs> I think I'm going to ask Jen to turn her camera off, if you guys don't mind, and maybe that'll help with her connection. Just give me one moment, okay? I think we lost her. Oh dear, I don't think she's on the call. <laughs> Sorry guys, thanks for your patience. Paul, are you there? Did you want I'm to- I'm right here, yourself? she'll dial, Jen will dial back in. She'll dial back in, I was riveted there. I can, we can talk that? about, we can talk about what 25 grams of protein looks like. It's about a chicken breast, she's calling you. Excuse me one quick sec. All right, I'm gonna go no, on mute, Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll chat to everybody. So I thought it was really interesting looking at how much protein after, like the way she pulsed throughout the day, like an egg is only six or seven grams. That's probably, a lot more protein than I imagined we would need. So, and I'm also very happy to see I can keep growing muscle mass. I was quite worried now that I'm in my forties, it's like, this is, it's all downhill from here. Apparently not. We can climb that hill and keep it rolling. So how's everybody been doing out there with the uh, pandemic? Staying active, staying busy, taking care of each other. You can unmute yourselves, we can chat. I, I see Zell's there. Been busy in the, the video, video you created. You got to create it. Absolutely. That's the only way there's opportunities in every day. We just can't always do what we always want to do, but we got to find those and exploit them and grow as much as we can. People still work, people working out in parks. What has everyone been up to? We can't go to the club and work out. Built a gym in the basement. <laughs> Love it, Adam. If you can see over my shoulder, I did the same thing, but my timing was pretty good. It was last December. That's a ninja gym I built for my boys last December. They wanted oh, it that's good. So, so we got the Ninja Gym. Don't ask me to nice. do it. They're much better than I am, but it's a great workout. It's great well, cycling weather. It's been pretty good, eh, Marguerite? Much oh, better. Oh, perfect. Just perfect. I mean, now I've been doing a bunch of mountain biking with my kids. It's been amazing. Wow. There's a, there's a great, everyone, there's a really great network of, um, of trails. Now, maybe most of you are living downtown as opposed to the northeast corner of greater toronto but we live in markham and and parks canada has built this fantastic network of trails that more or less starts in markham and goes all the way up to stouffville and it's just wonderful riding you're you're not close to ninth line or any of the busy highways you're out and you're cycling past farmers fields and you hear the birds and the roads are really well built there's there's boardwalks over swamps there's a place to picnic. It's just, and, and there's almost no one on the trails during the week. Marguerite, that sounds like heaven for a pandemic. There it is, right? It's, it's 15 minutes from the house and we're on the trail. Where, where, do you, where do you enter it? What's the trail called in case anyone wants to go check it out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, What's the trail? It's Rouge, Rouge River. Uh, look for Rouge River trails it's just finished work and that is the first time that has happened so i'm so sorry uh that that happened right there it just kicked me right out okay so i was saying to jen i literally had two last slides so <laughs> go figure um okay so let me just finish off by pointing out again we were saying 20 to 25 grams of protein per meal and i was liberating eggs and telling people you might even need three uh, eggs at a time and that's okay uh, I was going to point out that for our vegans or our people who are not consuming dairy in the group, that a good alternative to cow's milk is pea beverage, which I really need to point out um, is made with, from something that's spelled with P-E-A, like those kind of peas, so that there's no confusion. Um, there's a brand out there called Ripple, um, which is quite tasty, and that does contain protein. But I do want to point out that almond milk does not. 
Um, and so almond milk and cashew milks and a lot of those um, more nut-based milks contain virtually no protein in them at all. So pay attention um, because if you do want to be able to get your protein at a meal from the, the liquid part, you'll have to choose carefully. There are some products out there that have it, but not a lot of the plant-based. Greek yogurt is a great option for meeting your protein needs. You only need about three quarters of a cup for to really hit your your needs for recovery or protein in general. Cottage cheese is a great nighttime protein. It helps release protein as you sleep. And so people who really want to build muscle will get them sometimes cottage cheese before they go to bed and it protects their body from losing muscle while they sleep, which is kind of neat. Um, and then for the plant-based folk group, uh, I'll point out that hemp seeds give you uh, 10 grams of protein for three tablespoons. They're really high. So I use those on oatmeal and salads and in smoothies to jack up the protein a bit more. Um, and then let's not ignore, I know I made fun of the beans earlier for their fiber content and the uh, general explosiveness they lead to, but they can certainly be a great protein um, in recovery, let's say, maybe not before we train, but afterwards, most people on this call will need a cup to a cup and a half at their meal in order to get their protein needs met. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some good ideas and you might start thinking about which meals or in recovery um, that you maybe could stand to benefit from eating a little bit more protein. And again, I don't use protein powders very much, uh, very rarely. I mostly just eat regular food after I finish uh, a training session or a run. I just go and have my oatmeal. I put some hemp seeds and milk on there or some Greek yogurt and call it a day. So these are a whole bunch of snacks that you can also use for protein. So these are um, maybe not necessarily uh, for like enough protein for a meal, but if you're planning out your day and you're saying, hey, can I get a protein in there for all the fullness and, um, and the general recovery that it gives our muscles, great. And again, the underlying foods are our protein choices in there. And yes, I have a latte in there so that everybody can like me and think that I'm in their corner for putting uh, coffee on the list. So lots of good ideas there. And again, you can certainly, um, you'll get these slides later. Okay, so taking this all together then, what are the foundations of sport nutrition that we know really works? The first thing is that we want to eat regularly through the day in general, unless we're involved in a fasting type of situation, because that helps our body to rebuild muscle. It also helps us to get some of the carbs we need to be able to fuel our activity if that's important to us. So I generally say to plan our meal or snack every three to four hours, again, unless you're involved in fasting for weight control or some of the other reasons why people fast. Uh, at those meals and snacks, we want some protein and some good quality carbs, so fruits, veggies, or whole grains for both muscle building and energy. And then include a mixed meal in recovery after your workouts. Um, and if you ate a lot before you are uh, you worked out and the workout was short, then you don't have to eat that right afterwards either, right? If you're very well fueled, then just wait till your next meal, no problem. We don't need to overfuel ourselves. Water is the best choice most of the time, but every once in a while we might want a little bit of a carb or a little bit of electrolytes um, when our body needs it. In general, our carb needs are going to be different. Each of you is going to be different depending on those four images I showed you at the start. Are you in it just to be able to enjoy your sport or are you in it to train to be at the highest level? How long and how intense are the activities that you're doing? Um, and in general, I'm not telling people to eat carbs. Like if someone's on this call and they're saying, I'm just not into that. I don't want to do that. That's fine. If they make you feel foggy or unwell, what I'm just saying is it don't just because of what you've read somewhere or someone's told you exclude entire food groups because there really might be benefit to them for your health and your performance. And ultimately, if we feel well, we can get the best out of our sport, whatever, partic whatever sport we're participating in. So I've put together a couple sample days for you to put this all together. So I've got um, a nice uh, breakfast here that yes, includes some coffee. I've got some snacks with some protein in there, a nice lunch, um, an afternoon snack that gives us a carb and a protein, and then a nice balanced dinner. And oh, there's even some red wine in there. Fantastic, good, good for me for putting that in there. So now we can really be friends. And here's a slightly different version of the same kind of day. Um, and, you know, and if there's a treat or a dessert at night, that's completely fine. And there's a plant-based, some plant-based alternatives here, like a lentil soup or some hummus for snacks so that we can make sure everybody, everybody has a space here where they can fit. Okay. So hopefully that gives everybody an idea of, of some of the ways they could tweak their diet, or at least to confirm some of the things that we've already heard. Because remember, at the end of the day, 
this isn't about one size fits all approach to nutrition. We do need to personalize and customize if we want to get the most out of our training or out of our sport. So we have to do what works for you. And each client I meet with, this is exactly what we do. We try to make a personalized approach depending on their goals. Don't be afraid to be to experiment. Try having a little bit of that pseudo sports drink sometimes um, and see how that feels. Did you perform better? Or did you not? What if you ate before you uh, ran in the morning or went for your long rides? What if you took a little bit of a banana with you in between sets during tennis? See what happens. Be an interested observer. Um, but at the same time, we don't need to fix things that aren't broken. We have a lot of old science that is actually proven to still hold up like the fact that carbs are effective for performance. So your best practices are yours. They might be different than your partner or spouse. They're probably different than your kids, um, your training partner, and that's okay. And when we're doing this right, we're customizing and personalizing it for each of you. But at the end of the day, food should be enjoyed. So none of this should replace the pleasure and social value that food provides us. So just for fun to finish then, as I said, I'm in Florida with the Raptors. So if I was here in person, I'd be happy to bring in and show you um, a few of my Raptors uh, memorabilia from our championship run a couple of years ago. This is the view from the parade. Um, that's me kissing the trophy, which is some of those bottles are mine. I don't know. Um, those None of those people in that parade were there to see me, but I got to see them. And yes, I did get a ring. So there it is there. It's small. Fits my hand great. Um, there's my boss, Alex, giving me my ring and there it is with my name on the side, which is pretty cool. And like I said, in a normal circumstance, I would be happy to pass that around. Everybody can have a try on, but, uh, this is, this is what we can do for now. So that's it. So I did a few people said they wanted uh, to send me some questions already in the personal chat, uh, the direct message chat. So, um, here's my email address, drop me a line. Um, and, uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want my websites there. I'm going to look at the chat here. And while I'm doing that, oh, we got some nice thank yous. Oh, I appreciate that guys. Are there any other questions? Um, very glad I could still have my glass of red wine. That's what some people are taking out of this. They're like, you know what? The whole thing was lovely. At the end, she said I could have red wine. <laughs> Absolutely have your red wine. Are there other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions right now. I'm, I'm happy to answer them orally. And I'll stop sharing right now so you guys can see my face. Hi, Jen. I have a question, uh, actually, with regards to the amount of protein at any one meal. I've heard that 30 grams is about all your body can handle. The rest is just put stress on your kidneys. So I wouldn't know. I wouldn't say put stress on your kidneys. What it is, is remember I showed you that slide that showed you the maximum amount of muscle building that we can do at a time. Mm -hmm. So around 30 grams. And again, it's weight dependent. That's why I use 0.3 to 0.4 grams of protein per kilo. Okay. Uh, Cause we're not all the same size. Right. right. So, so for, you know, a little 115 pound female, it's going to be more like 18 grams for a great big okay. guy. It's going to be more like 35, sometimes grams it's size dependent. But the main thing is that higher protein diets are not associated with kidney issues. It's more just oh, that you've okay. maxed out your muscle building, can't build any more muscle. So you can eat more if you need it, if you need it to feel full, you know, or just as part of your regular diet, but you're not getting any more, you're not getting any more jacked from it. Okay. okay. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Jen, I appreciated the, um, the note on, from a, from a workout standpoint, I appreciated the note about the fasted workouts. Mm. So I think the myth out there debunking that myth about doing cardio on an, on an empty stomach, um, first thing in the morning is going to help you burn more fat. You know, I know, it's as a trainer, I go through a lot of like, when should I eat? When should I not? So that's, um, yeah. it's very helpful to see the science behind that. That the that you know there's a very lit if it's the it's uh, if it's under 45 minutes the graph is essentially saying you're not seeing that much difference between glycogen versus fat usage when you're trying to work out and do your cardio in the no. morning right so if, yeah and if you yeah. get a better workout for it and you you like working out better because you ate you're better off to eat you know on the other hand yeah. if you're gonna throw up then maybe don't you know or just have something super small yeah. Yeah. customized right uh, the one other yeah. question i had the one question yeah. that i had jen when you were talking about um the amount of protein in relation to what we should be um, consuming post-workout so mm. I, that's a question my my clients ask a lot you know um, if we're doing a strength training like a weight training mm. workout, um you know how how much protein and how soon so you answer yeah. that you know two hours um so but would, would something like you know power yoga or some sort of weight bearing exercise where, where yeah. does that fall on the spectrum? You know what? No the one's blood. done that study, right? So you have to, we have to use our brains to infer what they have shown is that the, where you seem to use them or need the most protein is from a whole body 
intense workout. So that goes all the way up to that 0.4 grams of protein per kilo is if like literally the whole body. So does a power yoga, is it going to do as much muscle damage as a, a weightlifting program? I mean, you're, you're a kinesiologist. You, you could speak to that as much as I could. My inference would be, no, there wouldn't be the same level of muscle damage as there would be from a really intense weight workout. But of course it depends, right? If the power yoga is 90 minutes, whereas the weight session was 30, it might come out about even, and then you do need that much. So it's, it, again, I keep saying it depends, but if they were both equal, if they're both 45 minutes, then I would say you're probably going to need more protein from the hardcore weight training than you would from the yoga. Thank you. And I, I've, I've tried that ring on everyone. It actually weighs about 10 pounds. You can buy it. <laughs> That's what hardcore weight training. You need your protein <laughs> after that for sure. Oh my goodness. Now I know why Jen's pipes are so ripped. It's from lifting. Yeah, it's just my one side though. The other one's <laughs> tiny. I'm like Raphael Nadal, you know? <laughs> Got to work on the symmetry a little bit. Um, That's right. I found the information on protein in maintaining muscle mass as we age really, really relevant. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, all of us, you know, we're not getting younger. So understanding how to maintain that muscle mass is so key. And we understand its benefits, obviously, to our long, like, longevity, but also our continued performance in sport. So yeah. the egg, I was like, wait a minute, I need to eat three eggs, not two. Yeah, yeah, I, we're liberating the egg. And, you know, it's funny because when I talked to Stu Phillips, who's the researcher at McMaster that's done a lot of that um, protein research, he gets his money, he ends up publishing on sport nutrition concepts, but his money comes from anti-aging um, research pockets. So there's a lot of overlap between healthy aging and sport nutrition concepts is that there's funding to understand how we can age better. And we've learned that a higher protein diet just leads to greater, greater outcomes. People are less likely to end up with fractures. People are more likely to be independent for longer. They can participate in sport. So it's not just about winning the Olympics. You know, it's about being able to live a long and healthy life and do what you want to do for as long as possible. And protein is critical for that. Really, really critical. Now, is it also connected to brain function, like having higher protein, is it having enough protein, is it connected to healthy brain function? Uh, you know what, um, hmm. my immediate answer is like, I can't think to say yes, but I can say that it will, I'm going more with the antioxidants there and the omega-3s. So that's your fruits and vegetables with a lot of color as well as your fish. So I'm going to say I don't think so but it would no it would be more a physical function but bone health is another one where it does play a role and people don't always think of that they think of calcium yeah. and uh protein is important for bones as well so i gotta eat lots of fruit and get my protein to have our muscles but keep my brain healthy and yeah you can't just eat protein sorry no. it's be protein shakes yeah there's got to be some raspberries too <laughs> and, and what about gut health how is that because that's obviously a very a very big topic now it's probably a completely different presentation about you know the relationship between you know, what we put in our gut and the health of our brains and yeah now that's that's there is some solid research there to say that the health of our gut impacts what we call neurotransmitters which are like serotonin and dopamine and so if we have a healthier gut healthier bacteria in our gut we are more likely to be able to produce um, some of the healthier or happier neurotransmitters and our brain works a little bit better how do we get a healthy gut that's we're still trying to answer that question but generally eating a more unprocessed diet, lots of whole foods, um, limiting things like the added sugars and so on, maybe taking a probiotic can help. Um, it, you know, and then things like if there's antibiotic use, taking a probiotic afterwards, but gut health is really a lifelong journey. You know, I think sometimes people want to fix it. You know, Hey, I had some kombucha one time, you know, now I have a healthy gut. It's, it's, it's a, it's a lifelong activity, but if our gut is healthy, our, not just our, our brain is healthy, but our immune system is healthy. Maybe even our metabolism. There's so many layers to it. It's a great topic. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Really, really um, got a lot out of it. Uh, just a, a question for me. Um, so if you do, because you mentioned about doing a, a workout and anything over 40 minutes, you can then have you know, more protein. What if you're doing like a high, high intensity workout, like for 25 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly goes back to my point I've been making all along, right? Is that somebody who's doing a power walk for an hour is using less muscle overall and probably doesn't need the recovery as much as someone doing a hardcore hit workout. But again, if you're doing your hit workouts four times a week, um, like I do hit workouts and I don't, I don't, 
like jack a protein shake afterwards. I just go and have a regular breakfast. So, but that's my point. I do eat something within two hours. So right. it's really, you've got to like hit the, the, the protein really hard and get like that shake and all of that. If you know that the next workout is going to be equally hard and it's like a day away or less. So I'll give you an example. Our national swim team, they do a hardcore workout in the morning. And again, at the night, we have to put liquid protein in their body because it digests fast. But for most people, if you're doing like a 30 minute hit workout, just make sure you eat breakfast afterwards, you know, do your eggs and do your toast and have some avocado and Bob's your uncle. You'll be fine. Um, but if a protein shake's easiest, then do a protein shake. That's fine. But if you're doing a hit workout, in the morning and then you're going to go and cycle for an hour and a half at night then yeah i would do a shake at that point something that's going to get that protein into you immediately um because it is hard work hit workouts are pretty brutal on the muscle okay well, one follow-up on that and sure. and i think i don't know maybe it's just me but um after i do a hit workout and i go very hard i feel nauseous a bit and mm. it's probably lactic acid or whatever how it do you is. How do you get rid of that? <laughs> you you keep training till you adapt. So lactic acid, and, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> lactic acid is uh, that's the thing that makes your muscles feel acidic, and um, it, it's when your muscles become acidic, it can upset your stomach. It upsets my stomach. Um, I went for a run in the Tampa heat this morning, and I was dry heaving afterwards, and it was just a regular run. Um, and that is the nature of the beast for some people. Now, if you really want to get down into like deep and dirty sport nutrition principles, you could start taking um, what are called buffering agents, which are there's certain supplements out there that can minimize lactic acid production. There's one called beta alanine. It's not um, that common, but it's quite effective. Um, believe it or not, baking soda does the same thing. And essentially what that does is it minimizes your body's production of lactic acid. So you might find if you wanted to take that supplement that it could help you to not have that nausea. But the other thing is the less lactic acid you produce, the less nauseous you'll feel. So you can choose to dial down the intensity a bit if you want and you right. won't be as pukey, right? So or you, this is or what you this... said is, yeah. Well, you said you could become a, a, a used to it. So, cause I'm, I'm doing it every day. I'm finding that actually I'm not as nauseous as I was three weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. This is where a good trainer comes in, to be completely honest, is to be able okay. to help you pick where the intensities are it's to say, you know what, your heart rate's really high right now, like you're finishing at a heart rate of like 170, you're going to be pukey every time you do that. And if they can come in and say, you know, maybe let's try and finish with your heart rate a little lower, then you're going to feel better, you'll enjoy the workout more, you're like more likely to go back afterwards. Right. And maybe sometimes you do those high intensity ones. I, I'm somebody who tends to go a bit too hard. So I have to dial it back sometimes and, and try not to, um, and me to keep that under control. But I guarantee you, if you see me run a race, I'm not fast, but I run mom speed. I will puke at the end every single time. It's an absolute guarantee. It's a, it's great. It's so fun to watch. <laughs> Jen, any comments Thank on you. that? We're, we're delving into X fizz now we're, we're on your, uh, I love it. I love it that you said, I'm sorry. It says iPhone. What's your name? The gentleman oh, who asked the question. Oh, Adam. Hi, Adam. I'm Jen. Hi. Nice to meet Hi, Jen. you. Another Jen. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I definitely love that you said, hmm, that makes sense. I've been doing hardcore workouts for three weeks in a row. Maybe I feel less pukey. This, like, your body will adapt to the level of stress that you put on it from a physiological standpoint. And as Jen said, I'm someone who tends to go pretty hard. Um, if, if you're not having that next workout, if you're doing it in the morning and then you're waiting 24 hours and doing another one the next, you know, you could probably wait the two hours till the pukiness goes away and then have your protein shake. It's not so um, essential to have it within the first 30 to 60 minutes, unless you're doing another hard workout in the evening. So you could probably just wait for the pukiness to subside. That's like the real technical term, pukiness. But um, your, your body, it's already getting stronger, obviously, because if you, you're feeling less nauseous because you're three weeks in then that, that means you're probably doing a really good thing. But if you have any other questions, you can email me directly and I'm happy to chat with you on the phone and give you some guidance because I'm I always happy to hear something. Thank you very much. Today. My pleasure. My pleasure. I may sure. follow up on that. Great. Please do. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have any questions for Jen? No, we're good. I, we have so many people still on the line. Wow. Well, I'd, I'd love to take the opportunity again. If you don't know me at the club, my name is Jennifer. I'm the, the new fitness director at the Boulevard. I'd like to thank everyone from the club, Bayview and Boulevard for joining us. And thank you, Paul, for hustling all your tennis section members as well. I did see all these great faces. Um, Jennifer, thank you. You are a wealth of knowledge and I'm very pleased to have you join us. So thank you so much for your time.
travel safe, get home from Florida, <laughs> bring those beautiful boys home. <laughs> you bet, you bet. Uh, thank awesome. you, everyone. I appreciate you all being here. I'm sitting in darkness now. It was so bright when we started. <laughs> like I have to go turn on the lights. <laughs> all right, well, we'll I hope to meet you all again soon. You guys. Okay, uh, thanks, yeah. guys. It, thanks, everyone. In person thank you soon. So much. Bye, thanks, everybody. Sir. Everyone. Bye now. Cheers. Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Bye, Hope everyone. Thanks, Paul.